Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Nicholas Sorota. There's a very nice hush of anticipation. I think we should therefore make a start. Um, I think for this audience, really, the work of Agnes Martin barely needs an introduction. Um, but she was, of course, um, one of the most distinguished uh, practitioners in the field of abstract painting in America in the post-war period. Um, when she moved to New York um, in the 50s, as many of you will be aware, she was immediately admired by curators and other artists. Dorothy Miller and others admired her work greatly. She was close friends with artists like Ellsworth Kelly, and she began to show with Betty Parsons. Um, at about the time when she was in New York working, Arnie Glimpshire established the Pace Gallery initially in Boston and then in New York from 1963. And it was at about that moment that Arnie came to meet um, Agnes for the first time. In the ensuing uh, 45, 50 years, they became close friends. Arnie, of course, continued to develop Pace Gallery. And as those of you who have visited the galleries in New York and elsewhere, and indeed since last autumn, the gallery in London, you will be conscious that it has been one of the most important galleries working um, in Europe and America over the past 40 years, showing some very distinguished artists in uh, what I would certainly say have been some very distinguished shows, not just individual shows of recent work, but also quite frequently shows that have looked back over artists at different times and shown combinations, and indeed many of the shows have been of museum quality. So Arnie is someone who is really versed in the work of the last 40 or 50 years, and as he came to know Agnes and from the mid-70s began to show her work, um, he formed a very close uh, friendship with her and was a regular visitor to her and to her studio in New Mexico. And last year, at the end of last year, produced um, this really magnificent book, um, which is a combination of his own reminiscences, um, Agnes's notes, um, and it gives really new insights into the work of Agnes Martin. Arnie is also someone who has not only made exhibitions of Agnes Martin, but also has encouraged others. And we were delighted when he was here um, 18 months, two years ago, at the time when we were showing a room of Agnes Martin's paintings that constitute one of the artist's rooms given by Anthony Doffe uh, to the nation, that Arnie was present with Millie and lent work to the show and to the display, and I have to say also eventually decided to make a gift of a work by Agnes Martin to the artist's rooms collection. So I do want to thank Arnie for that, and I also want, in a way it's a testament um, of his commitment to the artist and of his engagement with her work over a long period. So we're very fortunate that he should be here today to talk with us about Agnes Martin, and he will be in conversation, as you're aware, with Francis Morris. Uh, Francis, again, probably needs very little introduction, but you, some of you may not be aware that she has made some of the most exceptional exhibitions shown at the Tate over the past 20 years, starting with Paris post-war in 1993, Rites of Passage, a show curated uh, jointly with Stuart Morgan, the Arte Povera exhibition, one of the first shows here at Tate Modern, more recently the Louise Bourgeois show, the uh, Kusama exhibition, and now she is indeed working on an Agnes Martin exhibition that will be seen here at Tate Modern and subsequently in Dusseldorf, Los Angeles and New York in 2015. 
She, beyond making these major exhibitions, she was responsible with Ivana Braswick for creating the structure and many of the first displays for Tate Modern when it opened in 2000. She was involved in the reinstallation of the collection in 2006. Since 2006 7 she's also been um, head of international collections here at Tate and has spearheaded the creation of a number of acquisitions committees leading to the Tate acquiring major works from across the world. Um, as I say, she is going to be the curator, we're delighted to say, for the Agnes Martin exhibition in 2015. And there couldn't really therefore be anyone better than Francis to have a conversation with Arnie about the work of Agnes Martin. And I'm delighted that we've managed to capture them both on the same stage. And we'll now hand over to them for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's anywhere, anyone aside from the artist, would she be with us, who could speak better to her work. Um, during her lifetime, you did what most of us who work in the art world would love to do and always intend to do. Uh, you made notes, you recorded the conversations, and you wrote up re your recollections following your many visits to the artist um, uh, from the 1970s onwards. And the result is this extraordinary book which is a combination of Arnie's memoirs, but also with many of uh, Agnes's own writings, important biographical uh, information and an extraordinary bibliography. So as I say, it is my Bible. Um, and it's, uh, I'm following it uh, very carefully. Um, as Nick said, you met Agnes in the mid-1960s when you came back to New York from Boston, bringing your gallery with you. And I have an image of... Uh, if I can work this one out... No. Nope. So this is an image of the, the young <coughs> Agnes Martin, or the middle-aged Agnes Martin that you encountered then, uh, living in Lower Manhattan with a group of artists, including Ellsworth Kelly, um, Jack Youngerman. I believe you met uh, Agnes at a party at Jack Youngerman's. And the work that she was making around that time was very different from the work she subsequently met, but was clearly part of a journey towards the grid and towards a kind of minimal abstraction. And one of the things that I'd like to do when we get to um, think about our exhibition is really explore that journey. But your first um, visit to her studio uh, in New Mexico was a decade later, after she had had this uh, now well-known sort of break in her career. You went in October uh, 1974, at her invitation, I believe. And you continued to visit on a regular basis, really for the rest of her life. But aside from a final memoir, uh, the book uh, comprises your memoirs really from the 1970s. And it seems to be a period, and correct me if I'm wrong, when your relationship uh, with Agnes moved from, as she described, mutual toilers in the art world, Arnie, we are not friends, um, mm -hmm. to a kind of friendship. And I just wondered whether we could begin by you talking about what, you know, what that meant for you. What was that transition from toilers in the, uh, the art world to friendship? I, uh, <clears throat> I don't really know when that changed. Um, it's, it began at the beginning with Agnes just appearing in my gallery. I hadn't seen her for seven years. There was a hiatus in her painting. And she just said, would you like to show my paintings? And um, my partner at that time, Fred Mueller, and I were really thrilled about that. And she just disappeared. And about a month later, um, I got a telephone call saying, I will send you a map. And there's a plane tomorrow morning. Be on it. And it, it, it'll be, and you'll go, come to Albuquerque. So, of course, we were on it. But um, to begin with, Al, you know, Agnes sat me down and said, we are not friends. Uh, I have no, ro no room for friends in my life or sentimentality. And if you ever try to sell my paintings, 
I will leave you. <laughs> and and the, the whole idea was that if somebody wanted to buy the paintings, I was to allow them to buy the paintings. But if I suggested to anyone that they buy the painting, then I was committing a sin of pride, which was certainly very high on, um, <clears throat> on, her, on her don't list. So um, it, it just took, it was over a period of time that this happened. And it, I, but it didn't take so long. It probably took 20 years <laughs> to, to develop this friendship. But I always knew there was something between us. Uh, the first time I met Agnes at Jack Youngerman's, it was a, a loft party at Coenty Slip. This whole group of artists lives at Coenty Slip, and in this building was Lenore Tawney and um, Jack Youngerman and Robert Indiana, Ellsworth Kelly. Um, and, you know, we were a very small group in the art world. You all know a very different art world than I did. I knew a very intimate art world where we all got together on weekends and somebody had a loft party and there was not a very big audience and you know we were all there for a life in art we weren't there because it was in any way or shape or form a business you know the idea that anyone could make money in the art world was just lunacy it was Oh, was, was there any thought in your mind that you might represent her then she was showing with Betty Parsons wasn't she No she was showing with Robert Elcon Okay she had left Betty, and she was showing with Alcon, and she was very sort of unhappy with El Alcon. And sure, I was hoping that she would show with me. Um, that first night I met her, uh, we sort of clicked in some way, and uh, I received my first lecture on beauty. <laughs> so all through the party going on, everybody dancing, drinking, singing. Agnes was telling me, uh, the fundamentals of beauty and the search for beauty. So I thought there, were, there was something there between us. Um, and I hoped that might happen, but I had no idea that would happen very soon. We were showing uh, Jack Youngerman at that time. Right, yeah. So what did you think of her early work at that period? Well, by the time I met her, the work had already established the grid. Right. So. I was not privy to the development of the very early work, which is in this slide at the Whitney. But the, um, the work was already a grid. It was astonishing in that all of us who had met her then, who knew her, who knew the work, there are very few times in your life when you are seeing something that you've never seen before, that is non-referential mm -hmm. to the past. Frankly, a painting that doesn't look like a painting. And those works looked nothing like paintings mm -hmm. as we knew them. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there was the, the idea that was rampant was were these terrible or were these the, begin, the, the end of something or were they the beginning of something? Clearly they were the beginning of something. Mm -hmm. So there was almost this tabula rasa on which for me, forgive me as a kind of formalist still, um, one has to think, you know, what, what can come from this? Yeah. And so that was the most fascinating thing about the work. I mean, it suddenly was wham, like first seeing Cubism or um, and for, first seeing Agnes's work or first seeing Ad Reinhardt's yeah. work, yeah. which, you know, you knew the abstract expressionist, but suddenly there was this abstract expressionist that didn't have any of the identifying characteristics of the others and yet philosophically was part of the group, yeah. was making paintings that he believed were the end of painting. Well, he was a close friend of Agnes's and so it looked suddenly like she was making paintings that might be the beginning of painting. And then she stopped. And then she stopped. She produced a really rich body of work. And then she stopped painting for seven years. And then you began to visit. And then I began to visit her. She, she was painting again. Now, when she left, when she stopped painting, we were already friends. Yeah. And we were already acquaintances, workers together, and toilers in the art field. And um, she, uh, she said that she had made all the paintings she was going to make. She was never going to paint again. But frankly, I think she stopped painting because 
Pride was a particularly difficult emotion for her, and the paintings were becoming famous in this tiny circle. And was and it she pride or was it exposure? What, I mean, no, was it, what did pride mean to her? Pride, the sin of pride? Uh, the, well, it was the sin of pride that, that the, she should be, in any way be boastful about the work or mm -hmm. pleased with the work. Um, this sort of sums it up. Agnes um, said to me once, a potato farmer stands in front of his potatoes and says, these are my potatoes. She said, well, those aren't his potatoes any more than these are my paintings. We are both the locus where it happened. Now, that's a radical statement, but she was really divesting herself mm. of the responsibility of having made those paintings. And the paintings were, were something by themselves. And, and was the retreat to New Mexico part of that desire to escape exposure? I think the retreat was her inability to deal with the adulation of the of her circle for the paintings. So we've got some, I think we have a series of Polaroids that um, were taken during your early visit. Right, visits. so and in the I 70s the Polaroid yeah. was new, right? So we all documented everything from every smile your baby had to every visit we took to an artist's studio. And Agnes quite liked the Polaroid. And so we just grimaced and at the camera and made all these pictures. But what's interesting is um, Agne the record of Agnes's um, uh, lifestyle, her studio, her house, living on a mesa in New Mexico. And um, this was a studio that she and Bill Katz built together out of logs that were then adobed over the surface, stuccoed with adobe. But let's go, let's go on to another one. So it was very rudimentary existence. Um, when you visited, I mean, this was her life. You um, filled the tub at 10 in the morning, and hopefully the sun would heat it up by 4 in the afternoon, <laughs> and you could have a bath. Uh, <laughs> it was a very rudimentary existence. And uh, Agnes had a refrigerator and a stove, which was a big deal, and a generator to run them. Uh, I think we could go on. That, I'm actually looking at a, at a notepad I have uh, to see if I took down all of the notes. I was, going to, I was going to ask you about that. How did she feel about you taking notes? And she was conscious and you asked her if you could do that? Um, I didn't ask her at first. And one day she said to me, those are notes you're taking of things I'm saying, right? And I said, yes, of course. And she said, if you publish those notes and you said one thing I didn't like, it would be the end of our relationship. So why don't you wait till I'm dead? <laughs> and so you did. <laughs> so I did. It's my obligation. So this is great. So um, Agnes had a tractor, you know, for building her building and everything. We'd ride around the mesa on a tractor. Now this mesa she lived on was completely surrounded by, by water in the winters. And so she was stuck there for three, four months at a time without being able to get off. And during those periods were the most fruitful period of her painting. And nothing could distract her. She said to me, you know, I don't have a cat because they're so needy. Uh, <laughs> but she canned tomatoes and I remember walnuts and she had some hard cheese. And every meal was walnuts, tomatoes, and cheese Throughout for that the winter. winter throughout the entire winter. There could be no distraction from the painting. But I, uh, the other thing I love about this photograph, she is seated behind a vehicle, and there's a great passage in one of your memoirs where you talk about Agnes's complete passion for speed. She was a crazy driver. She loved crazy. cruising through the countryside. But as soon as she started talking and she got stuck on an idea, she would get slower and slower and slower. Yeah. But she was a very bad driver. I mean, she was arrested several times for speeding. <laughs> And her, her, the biggest problem was going through red lights. She could not fathom why you had to stop at a red light when there weren't cars coming. <laughs> she said it just made no sense. Why should she waste her time waiting at a red light when there were no cars? But I, I remember once she had a speeding ticket, and she had to go to court. And she was absolutely terrified. 
I've never seen her so nervous. And it got put off and put off. Finally, she didn't go, but she panicked. So it was the sin of pride and the sin of speeding. And the sin of speeding, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think sin of pride was worse, but. And then this um, wonderful landscape. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, on one edge of the, the mesa, and the trees would be in water during the winter, and the water would probably be six or seven feet deep. I remember one spring I came, and there was a, a truck that had been turned over in um, the riverbed, and I asked her about it, and she said, um, two Indians drowned this winter trying to get across the river. So it really flowed from the mountains at great speed. Um, the, the, the importance to the landscape, uh, to her lifestyle mm -hmm. in New Mexico is, is very evident in many of your memoirs, the, the getting to and from, the, the, the harshness of the winter, right. the, the brilliance of the summer, the quality of the light. And there's, there's a kind of inescapable, um, or it seems that in your descriptions of her lifestyle, you, 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 you cannot help but make comparisons between the work and the landscape around her, both both the natural landscape, but also things like the, you know, the, 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 the grid of the windows and the, uh, and the architecture. Is that something that, that has stayed with you, or is that something that really mm -hmm. was palpable just when you were there? Uh, no, I, it's interesting. I think all of that is completely irrelevant. Uh, we are seeing the grids on the floor and the windows because we know Agnes Martin's paintings. Yeah. We see the landscape and the kind of colors of the landscape because we know Agnes Martin's paintings. Her paintings were not landscapes. They were completely non-referential to anything in this world. They were uh, states of, the, of mind, states of existence. They were ecstasy, they were joy, they were happiness, they were innocence. These were the subjects that she painted. And there were periods that she would wait for an inspiration, and I would talk to her and she'd say, I was inspired by innocence, and I've begun this series of paintings. So it's so easy to take a Martin painting or anything with a horizontal line and say, this is about landscape. But it isn't. And um, if it's about landscape, it's about the landscape of the mind or the tissue of memory or the tissue of, 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 of beauty. Um, I'll tell you a quick little story, uh, which is in the book. <clears throat> My granddaughter visited her, and um, there was a rose in a vase, and Isabel liked this rose very much, and, and Agnes took the rose out of the vase, and she held it up, and she said to Isabel, she was talking about beauty, and she said to Isabel, is this rose beautiful? And Isabel said, yes, it's very beautiful. Then Agnes put the rose behind her back, and she said, is the rose still beautiful? And Isabel said, yes, the rose is beautiful. And she said, well, you see, the rose isn't there. Beauty is a concept in your mind. And that's what I'm painting. I'm painting with my back to the world. And indeed, there's a set of paintings which is owned by MoMA, um, a cycle called With My Back to the World. And the point that she's making is these refer to nothing but personal response to beauty, to innocence, to truth. So the role of inspiration is key. These are very key. radical paintings. The role of inspiration is key. And there's, there, are, is, uh, there are passages in your writings and both in hers where you both speak about you know, the emptying of the mind and images are kind of appearing almost ready-made. And she talks about the importance of, and you talk about the importance of meditation to her. And yet that seems to be combined by a real sense of graft I mean, earlier on, there was a, an inside the cover of your book, there were these fantastic notations of mathematical calculations over presumably proportions and lines. Mm -hmm. And then there are talk of studies and the whole uh, pattern in her um, working process of making and destruction suggests that the beyond inspiration, there was a huge labor. Um, there was. Um, the paintings are very carefully, their, their divisions are very carefully calculated. Um, there are all kinds of logarithmic equations on sheets of paper that were always around the studio to make a decision as to where the, uh, the, the lines were placed. She never painted a picture more than once. Paint never touched the canvas more than once. But if it didn't please her, 
she would repaint that picture on another canvas as many as 10 times. Nine of them would then be cut up with a uh, razor blade. And I think when you went in to see her on a visit in 1977, she showed you 21 paintings, and you selected seven. Um, of those seven, she was only happy with four. She said she'd repaint three of them. Right. I think a small group then went to Europe. She was a bit worried about that. And then the rest she destroyed. Would that be a typical kind of scenario for a yeah. period of work? Yes. You know, Mar Martin's herb is not huge. And um, it is very specific and is very edited. She's the greatest editor in the yeah. history of art. Mm. E editor artist in the history of art. So that Martin painted every day um, of her life that she was well, you know, that she could. But only about 5% of the work mm. remained. She just consistently cut up paintings. And it seems to me that you found that a very difficult aspect of your relationship. There's a, there's a really memorable section, and I think in the last, your last memoir published in this book, where she is, it, the, it's her, one of her last days. Mm -hmm. She's in um, a care home, mm -hmm. and she asks you to go back to her house, her studio, and uh, she says there are uh, three paintings there, and she asks you to destroy them. I suppose her last paintings. Well, she asked me to destroy two. So um, Agnes was very, as I said, she was the greatest editor, but she was totally in control of her work. And she knew the last painting that she wanted to leave in the world. And there were three paintings in the studio. It was about three days before she died. She hadn't spoken for a couple of days. We just, I just sat with her. We held hands, and she loved to, you know, she loved to sing songs from the 50s and 60s. So we sang sometimes. And she said, she said to me, um, "There are three paintings in the studio. The one on the wall is really good, and the other two I don't like. So go to the studio now and destroy those pictures." And she had a mat knife, in the, mat knives in the studio. So I got to the studio, and the two that were on the floor were magnificent. They were absolutely magnificent paintings. Perfection of, of a quality of absolute perfection. And the one on the wall was a very tumultuous painting. Mm. There are only two paintings should like I, I it. Should yeah, we, we should, should look at that. I find it, because mm -hmm. it, is, it is incredible. I'm going to have to whiz through lots of other tantalizing images to find Yeah, we can go back to, to things. There. So the painting on the left was painted in 67, in 68, and it's called Trumpet. And, um, and Trumpet was um, very atypical, that wash coming in from the side of the painting and the wash being uneven in a, in a very conspicuous way. And the painting on the right is her last painting. And it's very reminiscent of Trumpet. So here she stops painting. It was going to be her last painting. And then decades later, she decides on a last painting that also mm -hmm. looks like Trumpet. Now, I think it's very significant and kind of spooky that uh, that, that happened. And I only realized it when I saw the painting because I've always loved Trumpet. And um, nobody liked that painting for years. It was unsaleable. <laughs> and, and then about 15 years ago, it sold to an important collection. But it, it had even been to auction a couple of times, and nobody wanted it. And, and I, I always liked that picture very much. And so it just, I was just stunned when I came into the studio, studio and saw yet another version of Trumpet for the end of her career. But, it, it was difficult cutting up those paintings, but it was my job as her friend. Arnie, if you found her mistakes so her mistakes so beautiful, how, how can you articulate for us a little bit about what, in your sense, what constitutes a great Agnes Martin? Well, it's there isn't a bad Agnes Martin, because she she took care of that for us. She's edited the work so carefully. Mm. There is not a bad painting. 
But for Agnes, the paintings that are the closest to perfect in execution are the best paintings. Okay. And so um, a painting that may look absolutely beautiful and have a slight pooling of a color in more density in one area than in other, um, those were what you called mistakes and those were the paintings that were cut up and destroyed. Now, aesthetically, you could also look at those paintings and say those kind of mistakes are what the entire history of art that she drew from mm. was based upon. Because she certainly comes out of abstract expressionism. She considered herself an abstract expressionist. And an, an extraordinarily important aspect of abstract expressionism was the um, utilization of the mistake and, and uh, the, the kind of free form of, of think of Pollock. Mm. And so Martin was really erasing that influence as much as he possibly could and still making paintings that were basically expressionistic mm. and, um, and to totally abstract. You know, her feeling was that the painting was a chart. Um, obviously, art is a language. It's a language like French. It's a language like mathematics. And you learn to read that language. This, these are charts by which you arrive at a place um, of responsiveness that extends your perception. Um, Martin once said to me, from music, they accept pure emotion. From art, they demand explanation. Now that's very telling because the, 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 the person who will say, my kids could have made that painting, is the same person who has enormous respect for science. Mm. And they know no mm. more about science than they know mm. about painting. Mm. But this doesn't seem so serious, and of course it is. Yeah. Can we just, I mean, I think what's interesting is you're talking about this kind of um, expressionism within a very tight kind mm -hmm. of framework, a very yeah. almost rigid, um, rhythmic structure to her life and, mm -hmm. uh, and formally of the work itself. But, Beyond that, there was a, another kind of um, restraint that she imposed on occasions, not very often, which was when she made a series of paintings. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, now where is, so this is one of the series, of very few series of paintings Yeah, there are, there are three or four. And this was a group of paintings she made in 2001 for the Harvard Museum. Well, she didn't, she actually, the, the Harvard Museum was building um, a pavilion for her work in uh, Taos. And she made this series of paintings concurrently. And I came to see the paintings and she said to me, we're gonna give them away. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, we're gonna give them away. Every dealer's nightmare. <laughs> no, no, not a nightmare, no, not at all. I, I, I object to that. Um, I was first and foremost her servant. And, and her friend by and, this stage. And her friend, and, but I think that's you know, what one is. And it was, uh, it was her objective, and it was my, um, my duty to fulfill that uh, objective. But she, um, and, and so that's how these paintings got there. They were all blue. They look pink and blue here but they're not, they're blue and white. Do you think she set out to make a series or were they a group of paintings that she selected from a larger group that then she felt could be shown together? I think she set out to make a series because um, there was one painting that didn't work in the series which had a grid on it mm -hmm. and was too monochromatic and she asked me to remove that painting, that it was a separate painting. But uh, I would come to the studio uh, periodically. I, I never came during the process of making the paintings because that would have interfered with the pictures. And she, um, the week before I came, she was a nervous wreck. <laughs> and when, when she picked me up at the, at the plane, um, she was so agitated. She was so afraid I wasn't going to like the paintings 
which was, it was such an amazing innocence that this woman had, making these amazing pictures and worrying about my response to the paintings. But, but the truth is, innocence is really what it's about. She was a true innocent. Um, childlike to mm -hmm. the point that um, she decided in later years that she was losing her innocence and she had to give up everything that was intellectual and cognitive. So, so I remember a ride with her, and we were taking a ride around an, uh, an area around the mountains called the Golden Circle. And she said to me, you know, I think you should give up the intellectual. And I said, gee, it's awfully hard, you know, to, <laughs> after all this time. She said, well, I'm giving it up. She said, <laughs> she said, do you know what the hardest thing for me to have given up was? And I said, no. She said, Einstein's theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> so Agnes gave up Einstein's theory of relativity. <laughs> and, she, she, and, and then she started naming her paintings. Happiness, yeah. Young Girl. I mean, it's, they were the most, if to, to anybody who wasn't so sincere, they were the most stupid titles. <laughs> But they weren't to Martin. You know, she was, she was really serious. And you know, she made this movie called Gabriel. And it's a movie that's almost two hours. And it's just a young boy who walks up a mountain and everything he sees at his feet. There's a and still from it. There's a still from Gabriel. And somehow she, she takes Gabriel to the seashore and intercuts that with, mm -hmm. the, with the mountains. She took them to Los Angeles. But it's a, it's a very interesting movie in that it's not unlike a, uh, a Warhol movie. It is incredibly boring. And it's like two hours long. And after about 20, 30 minutes, you start to get into it. And, but the first at the, the beginning of the movie can be excruciating, and then you realize what she's doing, that it's, it's almost like a sensory deprivation experiment, and then everything you start to see becomes heightened because you're so hungry for some activity in the movie. I mean, that was really, I remember the first time I saw Warhol sleep. Um, Andy had just made the movie, and he showed it to a bunch of friends, and it went on forever. But you were so... Uh, completely annoyed by the movie and bored by the movie and you started taking everything for, gr for granted and then the figure would move and it was like an earthquake and, and at the same time in the scientific world we were dealing with sensory deprivation experiments where people were being put in yeah. chambers and their perceptual systems would begin to fire on their own and I think Warhol was doing that and frankly some of Agnes's paintings do that. Certainly the, the early paintings without washes give you almost nothing to hang on to. And you begin scanning that grid or those horizontal line grids and there the perceptual system begins firing itself from deprivation mm -hmm. or they become much more akin to mantras than they do to visual experiences. And all of her paintings, I think, are visual mantras. This constant repetition, this awareness of nuance that was completely invisible before you uh, confronted the painting. And we're dealing, with, we're dealing with a kind of visual music. And of course, music was a huge part of her life. Oh, and you just, just coming back to uh, the sense of innocence and um, uh, withdrawal and uh, in a way there, there are times in the memoirs where you, you indicate that she actually just kind of just wanted to get rid of the paintings once she was happy and you'd seen them. Yeah. But um, I just wanted to ask you about the exhibitions you made because that must have been a really key part of your relationship or, or sure. understanding the work, seeing the work in the gallery. And I wanted to um, just mention in particular this exhibition of grey paintings that uh, you, you talk about mm -hmm. having to convince Martin 
uh, to allow you to show them that it was the right thing to do. And I think you showed them in Soho. Yeah, and she to, was very, to show them in Soho. She was very nervous. Yeah, she Why didn't was want. She, so nervous? she didn't want them shown in Soho originally because she thought Soho was too commercial. But in your uh, in your in your um, in your memoir, you also uh, talk about that she was worried about failure. I think in her work, there's a, there's a note from her mm -hmm. to you, a little yeah. a little letter. Very telling letter mm -hmm. where she, she, she says she's, she worries about failing in Soho. Mm -hmm. What did that mean? Um, <clears throat> she was worried that the, that the paintings wouldn't elicit the response that she wanted them to. Um, but I, I think she was worried about herself, about herself not having, about not having satisfied herself mm. with the work. But she never hung her exhibitions. Did she come and see them? She came to see them. Yeah. But uh, her exhibitions at Betty Parsons were all hung by Barnett Newman. And all of my exhibitions I hung. Yeah. And um, it, was, it was very difficult for her to, she didn't know how to do it. Okay. She said to me, my job is making them, yeah. your job is presenting them, and we have two different jobs. And then beyond your, your gallery exhibitions, mm -hmm. she had in her life a few public exhibitions, but not really so many. And the, the bibliography, you know, the stack of catalogs yeah. is quite modest. Now, she didn't want them. She didn't want them. And in 1980, she was offered an exhibition at the Whitney, a mid-scale mm -hmm. uh, mid retrospective. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, I think she wrote to you, um, um, she described her letter as a Zen puzzle. And it was a Zen puzzle. Uh, which would unlock her reasons for not wanting to have a catalogue. Mm -hmm. Can you remember anything about that episode? It must be relatively uh, uh, Yeah, the, the Zen puddle, puzzle was the sin of pride. She didn't want to she have didn't, a catalogue. She wouldn't allow work. a book to be written while yeah. she was alive. Yeah. But was it also the sense that she didn't want this intellectualizing around her work? Mm -hmm. That she, had, she wanted a sense of Absolutely. Innocence. She didn't want the work described. She didn't want it intellectualized at all. She wanted you to respond to the work or not respond to the work, and it was legitimate either way. So writing was not something, writing by other people was not important. No, no. But what about her own writing? I thought this is a really beautiful prose poem. Well, her own writing was very produced. important to her. Um, <coughs> sorry. I have to get a uh, cough drop, which I actually left my coat. I'll be, be right back. You're tied to the chair. <clears throat> Maybe people would like to read it while Arnie's getting his cough drop. I think it's, maybe I shall make an aside here, that um, uh, I think it's very interesting that Martin, like a number of the artists that I've worked with, particularly most recently um, Yayu Kusama, but also earlier on Louise Bourgeois, were very reticent about other people engaging with their work. And in a way, to, to deny um, other people the possibility of writing is a, is, 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 is a, a kind of form of um, uh, control of, of, uh, uh, of uh, preventing or denying the kind of art historical associations or contextualization that one one might uh, otherwise find and there is uh, through the literature on Agnes Martin an absence of that sense of you know how she fits into uh, her period how her time and I suppose well, although it's it's um, from a curatorial point of view very sad to make a an exhibition of such a great artist without their help one of the things that, or their support, one of the things that we might be able to think about doing in relation to um, our exhibition at Tate Modern is for the first time to have kind, the kind of historical research and treatment that Agnes might not herself have um, encouraged in her lifetime. And one of the things I think is, I suppose, the first step in that direction, though much of it anecdotal, is, uh, is Arnie's memoirs, because Agnes Martin would not have approved of many of the things that you have said about her. And yet they are so hugely important, I think, in throwing oh. new light on the work. Why do you think? Well, OK, um, since we're, we're sort of running out of, of our time before we, um, uh, we open to the public, um, 
I, I think the revelation of her mental health, the fact that she was schizophrenic, is very interesting. I felt like I had to address that. Um, it was a very important part of her life. And uh, she was, um, um, she was um, schizophrenic. And she had many, she was hospitalized many times. And um, these, be these beautiful paintings come at periods of her life when her life is good. But it was a very difficult life. And so this beautific Buddha that we all know as Agnes Martin also wa was a person that, that suffered incredible torment. Yeah. I think it's important to know that, you know, people, especially for young artists, that these difficulties in one's life can be overcome. Mm. And uh, so I, I struggled a great deal as to whether to deal with that or not. Yeah. But I felt it would not be honest, and Agnes, I've honored as much as, uh, as I possibly could, and I think that um, Agnes loved young people, mm. uh, especially children. She really liked students. And I think, she, I think it would have been okay. I mean, what a, just, just um, noting down a, a few of the references uh, in a way to her, um, f the frigid fragility of her mental health. When you mm -hmm. make a you make reference, frequent re reference to the voices that Martin heard. So voices in her head telling her, for example, not to eat uh, when she was at work, uh, not to buy the music she loved, mm -hmm. uh, not to do any gardening for a period. Uh, and though she obviously desperately wanted to garden, she mm -hmm. felt she couldn't garden. Elsewhere she says, I get my orders and I obey. Mm -hmm. And then more worryingly, I thought, in 1978, my voices tell me never to take medication and I have no time for doctors. So, and at the same time, you, you, I must say, they're very moving, these descriptions of how she would, um, you know, uh, kind of massage her skull. And she mm -hmm. was obviously in a deeply troubled state much of the time when you were talking to her. She, she was, and, you, you know, I, I know I was the closest person to her in her life. But um, she had turned against me from time to time um, because the voices told her to. But it, it, was a, it was a very difficult life to produce these ecstatic paintings. Um, but she succeeded, and she overcame a great deal of it in her, in her older years, and I really pushed her to, um, um, to, to take medicine. How do you think that this revelation, if it, if it is a revelation, it seems to me reading the bio, bibliography that it is largely was a, a well-kept secret. How do you think it might change um, interpretations of her painting? Do you, do you fear a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, rash of pathological interpretations, a kind of psychobiographical well, stuff? These hardly look like paintings of a pathologically unstable person. Or, or maybe they do, I mean, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I knew Mark Rothko very well, and he, um, he drank a great deal. Mark didn't paint and drink at the same time, and Agnes didn't, and, and even though Rothko's paintings are of tragic themes, he did not seem tragic mm -hmm. while he was painting. Uh, Martin, uh, in the same way, Martin didn't, um, wasn't sick while she was painting. She certainly took her orders from um, other powers, but don't we all talk to ourselves? Don't we all hear voices? I'm not going to do that, or I'm going to do that, or you can't do that again. And we all have, you know, any disproportionate behavior finds its root in normal behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, so we all are subject to that kind of mm -hmm. situation. And I think that's why we, can, we all can recognize, you know, the quality of, of, of the work, mm -hmm. of this incredibly transcendent mm -hmm. work that um, we'd never seen before. We could... Um, 
There's a, there's a wonderful slide of the, of the trailer with the bricks. Let's, see if we can Let's just go back yeah. for a minute. And then we can run through this and I'll tell you sort of what they mean to me. Go oh, stop. Are, yeah? yeah, so I, this is um, Cuba, New Mexico, and Agnes had traveled with this uh, airflow trailer. Uh, when she left New York, she brought her paints and brushes and uh, canvas to my gallery, and she said, you know young artists, and I'd like you to give it away because I'm not painting again. I'm leaving for um, New Mexico, and I'm never coming back. And and so she left, and as I told you before, I hadn't, didn't see her for seven years. When I finally saw her, and she picked me up at the airport in uh, Albuquerque, and we drove an hour and a half to Cuba, went through the Mesa. It was, it was an interesting, this was quite an interesting thing. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, and I spent summers on a farm and things like that. We had to pass through several cattle pastures. And she stopped right at the gates. And the gates were barbed wire mm -hmm. attached to a vertical pole. And you had to know how to undo that. And she stopped. And she put her hands on the wheel like that, which I, I knew meant I should get out and, <laughs> and op open the gates. <laughs> and I saw her watching to see, is she going to be able to this open those test. gates? <laughs> this was a real test. And so um, I, I passed that test. But um, what was my point? The trailer. Oh, the trailer. So when we got up to the, the Mesa, there was a studio that had been constructed. And then this weird little building was there, this little adobe building that was this particularly stupid shape and couldn't possibly have been a an intentional building. And then I realized it was the trailer bricked in with adobe bricks <laughs> because the aluminum trailer interfered with the landscape. <laughs> so, Fantastic. so she bricked it up. Fantastic. And I love that. We slept in the trailer um, when we came to visit and bunks in the trailer. Fantastic. And, uh, and, and the studio had a kitchen in it and, and this and the studio. But uh, I thought that was just terrific. Arnie, here's you looking at um, some of Martin's painting in the studio. Shall we just spend five minutes going through the, sure. the images that you've particularly selected? Yeah. And then, then maybe <clears throat> we'd kind of open it up to some questions. Well, this was just you fooling around. And I, that's one of my favorite pitch, yeah. pictures of Agnes. And that's when she's, she's about 70 there, 68. One of my favorite paintings of Agnes's. Is, um, and it's also one of the first Grips. grids. Yeah. And she's using uh, raw canvas. And there's a pencil grid around the, uh, the, the center medallion. And then she begins to fill the pencil grid. I think it's really interesting the way that pencil grid was put on the canvas first and the white dots uh, stop and don't continue over the entire uh, grid. Um, uh, uh, very unexpected, I think incredibly inventive. This is called The Islands. And it's called The Islands. A lot of the early works have these evocative landscape titles. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, the Whitney Museum owns a series of paintings called The Islands. They're very, they're big yeah. paintings. They're uh, six foot square paintings. They're spectacular. I hope they'll be in the exhibition. And I, when I was looking at the, the paintings, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what? When I was looking at at those paintings when Agnes first painted them, and they were they looked like um, they looked like Maine porcelains, very pale blue and white, and incredibly delicate with very thin pencil lines transversing them. And I remember she looked at one and she said to me, the boats are going out, to, out of the harbor. I, I thought that was so extraordinary. And the same minute she'd say, you know, these don't refer to anything. But 
they were her, she was reading her own fantasies oh. into the paintings. And very beautiful. For me, those paintings have always been the boats going out of the harbor <laughs> <laughs> since then. She loved the sea. Yeah. She was an extraordinary <laughs> sailor. Uh, she used to go sailing with, with me and my family. And she was, um, she tried out for the Olympics from Saskatchewan mm -hmm. as a sailor. She also tried out, she was a swimmer. So she was a very athletic mm -hmm. uh, person. Uh, the Mackenzie River in Alaska, she navigated in, wow. in a canoe yes. one summer. We wow. never knew when she went away if she'd ever come back. <laughs> Didn't hear from her sometimes for six months. <laughs> And then, and, and then you did come back and you found wonderful paintings. And then, yeah, these were the first paintings. This from, was from 74. Yeah, so this yeah. was 74. She had not painted for eight years. And um, I came to the studio on the trip I just described, not knowing what to expect, having seen the last paintings were all on a kind of cream color canvas, um, almost raw canvas, and they were only divisions of horizontal lines. She had, all the vertical lines were gone in 68. And when I came into the studio, there was a set of these paintings with various uh, um, proportions, and all with this vertical band down the center, which none of us had ever seen. It was so radically different from any other Martins. I, I was really shocked. And my first response was, they're gorgeous or they're terrible. But uh, they were gorgeous. This is a very unusual series of paintings that came in... 83. 83, thank you so much. And again, it's like um, the last painting where the wash is very active mm. and very beautiful. And they're, they're not made with paint, they're made with India ink. India ink uh, put in a, in a bottle of extender so that the you looked at the bottle of, of water and it was just gray water. And these paintings were all painted with variations of that mm -hmm. India ink. So the darker passages are not overpainted. They're another it, it density of India ink that, uh, that comes afterwards. And this is where you've talked about Agnes's um, design not to have too much pooling of the ink. Exactly. But it was really important to get it exactly. absolutely right. So these paintings came <clears throat> just after I sent her a book. I was in China and I sent her this really beautiful book on Chinese brush painting and um, wonderful scenes of uh, little figures on mountains and landscapes and trees. Classic, classic Ming brush painting. And when I saw these paintings, and there were some that actually were grids, and I was standing in front of one that was a grid, and she said to me, imagine that you're one of those little men in those Chinese paintings, and get into those boxes and look around. So, so it, see, there, there was a level of nuance beneath perception that she was striving for, mm. and that she was hoping that we would respond to. Mm. Um, another two years later, 80, 88. So how different, you know, two years later, the, the paintings are. They're very precise, they're much more uh, formal, they're much less romantic. Um, there's no sentimentality, which she always claimed she had absolutely no use for sentimentality, but I don't think it was true. And Arnie, when you, you talked about her working very intensively over, for example, the winter period, mm -hmm. <clears throat> when that was the case, all the works would be more or less related in yes. terms of their overarching Absolutely. design. Yeah. So then when we get to this <coughs> painting, this is a year on, this would have been one of a, a series of related, much darker paintings. Yeah, so this was quite shocking. I uh, came to the studio and there were 10 black paintings very dark paintings, slate-like, not transparent, paint applied much thicker, and uh, they seem to be the antithesis of what Martin's painting is. But they were, they had this haunting beauty. But it's interesting that she never went back to this. Yeah. Um, most of her works, you see relationships going back and forth in time. These really are an island. 
Um, I love these paintings. I think they're extraordinary. Mm. And all the paintings that we've been looking at in this sequence have been 72 by 72. That was her standard format. Mm -hmm. She Always. also worked on a very small scale. Right. And mm -hmm. she worked on t uh, 12 by 12, 12 by inches. 12. So then, but then, did I skip one? Um, then this is... In 95, we mm -hmm. suddenly get a smaller scale. This is 60 by 60. Yeah. Yeah. Why was that? Um, she never had a studio assistant. Martin made all of her paintings herself. No one was ever in the studio with her. And she was having a lot of problems with her back. And she called me and she said, um, the, the news is I'm making small paintings. So I expected to see paintings <laughs> like that. And um, I came to the studio and I saw these first paintings. And they also are paintings just flooded with color. It, everything changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And Martin began coming out of herself a little more. Mm. Um, in the earlier days in New Mexico, you could visit her home, and on the, the doorposts of the house, it said, at your own risk. <laughs> and there were times that I, I've been told that she came to the door with a gun when people tried to bring her some cakes or food. She said, you know, you're not my friends. Don't come and visit me. I don't want neighbors. And <laughs> But she started to let people come to the studio. Uh, she would go to lunch with people. Mm. It was a, a big change, and the color started to flood into the work. And in a funny way, I think that the denial of the early work, this incredible sense of denial, um, was now giving way to, in Martin's terms, a kind of opulence and pleasure in the paintings. I think she wasn't afraid of the sin of pride. She didn't mind as much that people really liked her work mm -hmm. and liked her. Uh, however, she was very, uh, very strong in asserting that her life and her work were two different mm -hmm. things and had nothing to do with each other, which, you know, is absolutely not true. And yes, and then of course, just a few years later, as you said, you get these wonderful paintings with these gorgeous titles. I think they're yeah. gorgeous titles. This yeah. one's Lovely Life. Lovely Life, yeah. Um, from 99, and then this one is Affection from 2001. Mm -hmm. So these are titles that she would have been embarrassed to put onto the early paintings, or not embarrassed, incapable of. Um, but Martin opened up, you know, it's, <clears throat> a lot of people have wonderful youths and young lives. And I think very few people have wonderful old ages. Mm. And she had a wonderful mm. old age. And I, I take a great deal of mm. pleasure in that mm. and comfort in that, mm. that the end of her life was good. And, um, and she knew when it was over. Mm. You know, she, she stopped painting and she, and she died um, two months later. Mm. And she painted up until that point. Now, this is one of Martin's last paintings, which really astonishes people. It's, you can't read, it's just this is, black. This is called The Sea, yeah? It's called The Sea. Yeah. And there's a painting um, of the sea that's actually blue in the fish, again, in the Don Fisher, Fisher yes. collection, which has to blue be in gold. the show. Has to be in the show. Has to be in the show. <laughs> <laughs> and this painting, the lines are incised. Now, I have a drawing it's actually, she gave me this painting, which I, I really loved it. And I, she, uh, she was with me on my birthday. I was there, and she gave me the painting. And I have a drawing from 1960 that is the exact same format as this painting. Mm. From 1960? From 1960. Which is, which is a great is, again, so this pairing. This, yeah, this really interests me a lot. I did an exhibition, <clears throat> um, the last exhibition of Martin, was called Closing the Circle, Early and Late. So the painting on the left is 1959. The painting on the right is one of the last paintings she ever made. So she's, she really comes back around to that. And Martin never made a painting with a shape like that mm. since, since the 50s. Mm. And, but the shape is floating on a field of wash that's indicative of the mature mm. work. Is it significant that it's called homage, homage to life? I don't know. It seems poignant. It's poignant. 
1959, and um, I don't know what date this is. It's 97. 97. So the, the painting on the right um, is part of a group of paintings that come every so often where they're just one line. And um, I have it in my mind that the next Martin show I'm going to do is gather all of those one-line paintings. And I think they're just going to be staggering. It's be like looking at a different artist. And also the, the late 50s. Uh, yeah, you could see how influenced she was by Rothko at that time. And there are several paintings like this that are soft focus, that are very much influenced by Rothko. But that division in the middle, again, is another one of the one-line paintings. And finally, this, this juxtaposition we talked about earlier. And that so we talked beautiful. about earlier. Yeah. So this, um, this is an exhibition. This was my early, late exhibition, Closing the Circle. So the, the center painting is 1959 again. And the painting on the right is, what, 2000? But again... 2004. 2004. Yeah. And there is this very experimental moment right towards the end of her life. It's, everything is up for grabs. Again. Everything's up for grabs. It's not just a return. There's no. a, there's oh, a no, sense no, no. of moving forward into In, a, incredibly a kind of summation daring. of everything and yeah. yet a, a lurch forwards. And was that yeah. related perhaps to a, a, a kind of late... Um, calmness or resolution or happiness in her life? What was driving I don't that? know. Maybe a, maybe a level of satisfaction. I know that she, I know at the end of her life she felt that she had done her work well. Mm. That was really important to her. She felt she had done her work well. She felt that um, there was, a, that there was reincarnation. Mm. Um, she said, well, we won't know each other, mm. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not going to be like friends. that. She said, it'll be like getting off the train in Connecticut and not knowing anyone. <laughs> Arnie, we, should, we could go on all night, and I want to open a discussion up for questions, but one of the, I mean, this, you have to read the book. It's full of wonderful revelations, obviously profound revelations about the meaning and genesis of the work and its, its context, but also just wonderful revelations on a human level. And I suppose one of the images that I'm, I don't know, maybe I, I need a drink, it's getting to that time in the evening, but the image of Agnes Martin awaiting your arrival and then getting the Campari out and a block of ice from the fridge and digging away at it with her chisel right. so you could have a drink before. You really did read I the really book. did read it. My God. Anyway, I do urge you um, <laughs> all to um, grab a copy and, and uh, enjoy it. But um, we have Arnie here, and we have a few more minutes, and I would just love to uh, invite any, any of you to ask anything. And we have a mic, I think, that if you can. Thanks. I um, really enjoyed that talk. Um, you mentioned the sin of pride a number of times. And I wondered if you ever spoke to her about it and got to the bottom of what, what caused it or what... what what was bit lay behind it? Was it was it her mental state, or was it something in her upbringing, or mm -hmm. you well, must have she, a theory on that? She it. was a she was a Calvinist, pure. She grew up in a Calvinistic household, and I think it was certainly preached within that household. I believe strongly it was she was incredibly shy. It was very difficult for her to interact with people. These were all the. Um, the bricks and mortar of protection. And I think we all do that. So um, she was certainly not somebody who believed in um, a, a supernatural being. Um, she, she was very much a Buddhist. Um, she believed how you know we were incredibly unimportant, just the locus where things happened. But I think it really was all, all tied together. And that was just something to latch on to and focus on. Well. Congratulations on the book, which is a sort of publishing coup. The design of it and the inserts of the notes are extraordinary. Um, Thank I you. wondered if you. Um, thought there was any relation with music in terms of, you know, 
contemporaries like Steve Reich or, or um, Terry Riley or Philip Glass, uh, the whole minimalist movement in music? Um, well, we sort of all, you know, we knew all those people. Um, I, she never talked to me about, uh, I think I gave her um, a record of Terry Riley, uh, Rainbow and Bent Air, which I like very much. Uh, but I not, sh she never talked to me about that. She was addicted to Beethoven. And you couldn't come into the house without Beethoven playing. And she thought he was perfect. Uh, there were a few perfect things in the world. Beethoven was perfect. She also loved classic um, songs of the 40s and 50s. She loved Blue Skies. <laughs> she, she liked Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and knew all the lyrics. You know, when we, when we would take our drives around the Golden Circle, uh, I, those are my favorite songs too, so we, we would just sing for hours going around the Golden Circle. Um, you mentioned her interest in Mark Rothko and, uh, as, as an influence early on. Is this working? Yeah. Um, what about later on? Did, what, to what extent did she take any interest in other artists? and keep, keep up with what was, what was, was happening? Um, she was aware of what was happening. She got catalogs of exhibitions. Um, the artists that she was devoted to, <clears throat> sorry, were the abstract expressionists. Um, her favorite artists were uh, Newman and Rothko and Reinhardt. She did not like, no, she did not like Clifford Still. She did not like de Kooning. She called de Kooning, as well as Oldenburg, pornographers. Uh, <laughs> she, <clears throat> she has very specific tastes. She also, I think there's somewhere in your, in your book that um, uh, you talk about her dislike of Robert Morris and Richard Serra. So there was, she was obviously <clears throat> engaging with a younger generation. It was interesting. She said, uh, to, she, she, she said that Richard Serra was anti-art. And um, there were several, there were a lot of artists she didn't like. Louise Nevelson she admired. She adored Nevelson. Um, as P, they were very good friends. And uh, anyone who knows Nevelson, she was an incredibly flamboyant character and amazing clothes. and. Agnes Martin was wearing her uh, overalls and uh, Indian shirt. Um, <clears throat> but she said to me one day, Nevelson and I are just alike. She dresses up so that nobody can see her, and I don't dress up so no one can notice me. <laughs> what, what about Richard Tuttle? Because he's... Very he, close to Tuttle, a, yeah. yeah. She was very close to Tuttle. She um, liked some of the work. Mm -hmm. She never was incredibly, uh, she never praised the work um, openly. I know she liked the work. Uh, I'm very friendly with Richard Tuttle and I, and well, after Agnes died, a couple, a year or so passed, and Richard called me one day and said, um, it's time for me to come to your gallery now. And, um, it was a bit of a, a, a bit of a shock because I love his work. I always loved the work. I bought the work through the years, but we both knew that he could not be in the gallery with Agnes. That she would never have stood for such a mm. close friend of hers, um, vying for my attention. Mm. So she was she was very possessive. Mm. You know, she she was demanding, but you know it was wonderful. It was worth it. In the wonderful film with My Back to the World, she speaks about waiting for paintings to materialize in her mind. How, mm -hmm. how could you say something about this? And you also mentioned about meditation. Did she meditate and then the paintings appeared? How, how, how did this extraordinary <clears throat> thing happen? I don't think that the paintings appeared out of meditation, though I don't really know. Um, I think she could wake up 
from a dream and have her inspiration. But she would never go to the studio and begin painting unless there was a subject to paint. So was, she was painting subjects. Um, the, these paintings were, were specific. And did she literally wait five months sometimes? She did. She did, but not frequently, and not as she grew older. As she grew older, maybe it was the awareness of time, um, the periods of waiting became much less. She painted proportionately more the last 10 years of her life than any other period. And uh, there was a kind of vigor and joy in those paintings. Um, and th there was absolutely no restraint. Any other questions? Arnie, what would you hope from my exhibition? <clears throat> I hope it would make people happy, because that's what she would have wanted. Thank you. I think without further ado, I'm just Well, there's, one more, oh, there's one, more one more question. Sorry, maybe this is a fitting question to end on. I was just intrigued at the beginning when you said that you asked my Agnes Martin to go back to her studio and to destroy two of the paintings of the three that were left. And I just wanted, wanted to know what the two were that you had to destroy. Uh, the two that I had to destroy were very dissimilar from the one that was left, which you saw the picture of. They were much more rigorous. They were less emotional paintings. They looked more like the 70s than they did like the, like the uh, 90s or the late work. They seemed to be a little bit out of context, but perfect paintings, really exquisite paintings. So I took the box cutter and sliced them to ribbons. But I had done, you know, it wasn't, su it wasn't such a terrible thing for me to do because I had done it with her before. Um, as she grew older, it was harder. It's very hard to cut up canvases. And it was actually harder for her. So I would help her sometimes in the studio. How extraordinary to have had to destroy so many masterpieces. Her friendship. I, I, yeah, I guess they weren't, though. <laughs> Arnie, I just, um, one final question. Your, um, your memoirs uh, published in this book really cover the 1970s. And then, as I say, there's a leap to a sort of final moment. Mm -hmm. um, you must have made many other visits in the intervening years. Uh, do we anticipate uh, volume two? No. I've said uh, everything that I'm going to say about Agnes. But um, volume two will probably be my memoirs. <laughs> well, I think what's, what's wonderful about this book, beyond the insights into Agnes Martin, is so many insights into your own life, um, your past, your present, your working practice, your gallery, um, your dislike of mutton chops. It's one of the, the um, they were resting like, images they were of like your rubber. first visit. But um, <laughs> I look very much forward to your future exhibitions of Agnes Martin as well. And well, I look forward so to yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.